Well, a tough act to follow after that um, excellent address. My name's Hugo Batten, and I'm the head of renewables in Aurora's GB Energy team. I'm here to facilitate what I'm sure will be an excellent panel, disruptive technologies and the future of energy markets. I'm joined today by the speakers on my left. They've promised to be forthright and direct, so we have a robust conversation to look forward to. Uh, Dermot Nolan, Chief Executive of Ofgem. And I'm told by John, the only non-Aurora person who's attended 100% of our spring forums. Um, Tim Emmerich, the CEO of UKPR. Alex Voigt, physicist and serial entrepreneur, most of whose businesses um, have been orientated around renewables. And Jojo Hubbard, the co-founder and COO of Electron. Just a reminder before we start, if you are tweeting, please do use the hashtag, uh, hashtag Aurora Forum. Let me kick off the panel uh, by offering a framework for the topic. Firstly, as much as we talk about disruptive change at conferences like this, we're extremely bad at accurately forecasting it. It's become something of a parlor game amongst the cognoscenti to look back at previous forecasts and chuckle about how wrong they are, but indulge me for a moment. The top left-hand side, we've got the IEA forecast for coal, which they've revised down consistently over the past seven to eight years. Um, we've been slow to conceptualize a world with low demand for coal supply baseload. And on the bottom left-hand side, we've got the GB wholesale power price. Another example, very different, where almost all industry forecasters uh, forecast a return to 70 to 80 pound per megawatt wholesale prices, although not Aurora, I might add. We've picked on deck slash bays here, but any no number of industry forecasters said the same thing. As an industry, we struggled to do the quite tough maths to understand a system that had flat wholesale prices, but because of rising renewables, had a lot more price volatility. A system disrupted by technologies that we knew were coming, but whose repercussions we didn't fully understand. And even when we do foresee the disruptive change, we often underestimate the pace and extent of it. On the top right-hand side, much as the IEA overestimated the future of coal, they underestimated the rise of solar, particularly the impact of potential synergies with cheap lithium-ion batteries, which Mateus discussed. And on the bottom right-hand side, National Grid, in their future energy scenarios, have made significant upward revisions in their forecasts of storage, primarily lithium-ion batteries, as the capex reductions everyone forecasts are becoming reality. So we anchor the past and we underestimate the pace of change. It's not just that we guess things wrong necessarily, but we often get them wrong consistently and in the same ways each time when we conceptualize big, large-scale disruptive change. But in reality, not all work, uh, disruption is the same, and some disruptions are more forecastable than others. We've borrowed from Donald Rumsfeld to develop a very broad taxonomy of technology-driven div disruption in three categories. Known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. So to the first, known knowns, which we, by this we mean technologies we understand, but who come of age because the market conditions change. The energy industry did foresee to some degree that we'd need more flexibility on the system to manage high levels of renewables, but the extent of the rise of reciprocating engines, or peakers, surprised most observers. The capacity market helped. Paying for peak capacity on a pound per kilowatt basis incentivizes the introduction of cheap kilowatts of capacity, and agile and innovative players like UKPR accelerated this process. Theoretically, this is the most forecastable type of disruption but all of history looks inevitable in retrospect, and we'll discuss with Tim shortly how UK, UKPR thought about this, this disruption-driven opportunity at the time. Next, we have known unknowns, where the technology exists, but there are rapid operational or cost improvements. Here we show Aurora's view on the required spreads between charging and discharging in an energy arbitrage business model that we think are required to make batteries economic in 2018 and then 2030 when we forecast battery cell cost reductions uh, dropping. But there are a number of uncertainties here that are very different to, difficult to forecast. Future volatility in the wholesale market, battery capex reductions, and the evolution of ancillary market design. We know these things matter, but they're hard to forecast. And we'll be talking with Alex shortly about which of the known unknowns he thinks we're getting most wrong at the moment. And finally, unknown unknowns. Uh, technologies that are new and where the impacts are unclear. Um, for the purposes of this exercise, we've included blockchain in this category. The technology is new, and it's very hard to forecast the full impact of blockchain on the energy system. Its advocates argue that it has the potential to reshape the whole architecture of the system. We'll ask Jojo shortly about how blockchain will impact the system, and if the energy industry is thinking in the right way about potential future consequences. So with that introduction out of the way, um, Dermot, if I could start with you. 
given that brief bit of context and the taxonomy, can you describe the process you and your team at Ofgem go through to factor in the impacts of disruptive technologies on future reg regulation and perhaps give us an example that you're thinking about at the moment? I think we, I, yes, I, could, I suppose I could give you many examples. First, let me say thank you for having me back again after uh, <laughs> clearly visiting too many times. I hope I haven't outstayed my welcome. I, I confess to not remembering the first time I was here. So I've been told I was here four <laughs> times, and I only remember three, which uh, is, is making me somewhat concerned about my memory. Um, anyway, a, a pleasure nonetheless. Um, I, I won't. I will briefly, uh, but hopefully not belabor the point, but I'll briefly discuss the idea of innovation. I suspect the vast majority of speakers here have commented, so I will join them, have commented that you know, the extent of innovation in energy is greater than it's been for 50, 60 years. Uh, not even just since privatization. I don't think privatization changed some of the fundamental technologies. So I think the scope for innovation in the next five, 10 years is enormous. Um, I also will say that as a regulator, and, and to some extent echoing, I think, some of the ministry's comments, and I'm, I confess I probably said this last year and the year before, but the regulator does not have a crystal ball. Um, I've said that many times and will probably keep saying it f fundamentally because it's true. Uh, we cannot predict the future. We would not attempt to predict the future, nor would we necessarily, um, as it were, say this innovation is a superior innovation to uh, another innovation. And yet, together with government, in many ways, we hold a rule book, um, by and large. Uh, there's this obviously licensing system sent, set out in legislation and in some sense operated by us. Then there's the rule book of charging arrangements, there's the codes, there's, a, there's the complex system that was set up uh, for good reasons at the time in the late 80s, early 90s that actually did come out of privatization. So there, there is that complex system and I freely acknowledge there is a system that is almost certainly not fit for purpose going forward and will need to be changed. So against that background to give a, a number of examples of some of the technologies and believe me I'm Please don't take offense if I don't make, mention your particular technology, but I will give an example of some of the technologies where we th think main, you know, the current system doesn't necessarily fit it. I'll give, the first one I'll give is something that I think is in the process of being changed. Uh, the whole sense of storage um, over the last 12 to 18 months, both the, the regulator and the department uh, decided to try, try to say storage is not in the appropriate regulatory uh, environment. And thus, we brought out a flexibility review, which, amongst other things, is looking at changing many of the rules in storage. So that's, I'm not sure if that's a known known uh, I don't, uh, in Rumsfeldian terms, but nonetheless, that's, we're already, in some sense, doing that. But then you look at some of the, perhaps, if I may say, the newer technologies. So if the issues, for instance, like peer-to-peer -peer trading of energy, which may or may not include blockchain, depending on your terminology, but the sense that someone wants to trade energy with my neighbor. I want yeah. to provide energy with my neighbor. I've got a... You know, something renewable in my backyard, I want to give them that, they want to, be, they want to know it's renewable energy. How do you actually do that? Um, if you need to use the grid briefly, how, how do you deal with peer-to-peer -peer trading? Certainly it wasn't set up for that. The framework is not set up for that at all and, and, and is still not set up for it. Um, a couple of other issues, slightly different issues because these are models that are extant in the market, but within the retail space, and I'm going to move sort of seamlessly or semi-seamlessly between the, the, the different parts of the energy chain, but in the retail space, we've seen um, entities that are entering the market that have been innovative in the sense that they're almost asking for power of attorney. I won't name any particular kind of, uh, any particular company, but companies that are coming in and saying to the, to the consumer, pay us a rental fee, essentially, we'll switch you, you will we'll make sure you're always on the cheapest deal, or almost always on the cheapest deal. How are they regulated? Does, does the framework for data, does the framework for the fact that the supplier in some sense is the controlling entity? Mm. How do they react with the supplier? How indeed do third party intermediaries interact with the supplier? Uh, that particular framework may not be fit for purpose, is almost certainly not fit for purpose going forward. And just to give another couple of examples, um, the idea of, in some sense, electric vehicles as the next, as an important phase of, of decarbonization, the decarbonization of the transport system. There's obviously the possibility that demand, the likelihood that demand for electricity will arise with the onset of EVs, but also the possibility that how will we have a system whereby the battery in your electric vehicle could potentially sell electricity back to the grid? Mm. Uh, is the system fit for that? Not really, mm. not yet, as it were. Um, there's the final point of the sense of how network innovation is generally happening, how, and I make no apologies for saying that, a setup of monopolies that mm. are that are still, and you know, 25 years later, I think, the regulator and government are determined to make non-monopolies over time. Mm. Um, so in that sense, how do we facilitate innovation in, in those kinds of areas as well? 
Now, the answer to that is uh, not simple, so I'm not going to even attempt to give it, but all I'm going to say is, in some sense, we are thinking about innovation. Very, I think we are listening to innovators a lot. We are making some changes. We have specific issues of, um, we've, in the last 18 months, we've set up something called our Innovation Hub, our regulatory sandbox, which has allowed a, lot, a number of new entrants to come in and talk about how the system works, and potentially to trial some kinds of new technologies. So we're very focused in innovation. We need to, I think, over the next, three to, next two to three years, potentially work both ourselves in terms of the charging arrangements that are in place, and I can talk more about that later if needed, but the charging arrangements in place, and ultimately the licensing arrangements, we need to work with government to ensure that those taken together will facilitate new entry. So then, as the minister said, and I'm focusing on the last, last part of my comments on retail, when the price cap is removed, how will we have a more diverse set of players in the market with regulatory arrangements that were not designed 25 years ago? Hmm. Not a straightforward answer, but something that is probably the single biggest thing we're working on. Yeah. Tim, if I could perhaps bring you in here to, to comment on uh, the known knowns. You, you've been at the forefront of the current flex period of disruption. Um, how did UKPI identify the opportunity at the time? Was it in response to a set of kind of market regulations? I, I think we heard slightly controversially that um, RECIPs were getting double, double rewarded with the triads. Or was it a recognition of fundamental underlying changes in the market that needed flexibility as a response? Um, sure. Well, uh, first of all, on the double dipping comment, I think it's ironic coming, the person that said that, the company they represent saying that because they're one of the biggest double dippers in the energy industry. When you have uh, black start units getting 10 year long term agreements, um, uh, getting their capex subsidized and then getting capacity market revenue on top of that, to me that is double dipping, but uh, he, he is an expert. So um, I'm not surprised the comment. And also, when you make a comment about the energy costs you know, in the future, because of recips being 70 to 80 pounds per megawatt hour, per megawatt hour it then um, defies belief that CCDTs can't make it in the CM without a significant uh, refit or twerking <coughs> or uh, uh, twisting of the rules. And uh, because if it is 70 to 80 megawatts, uh, 80 uh, pounds per megawatt hour in the future, then why can't a CCDT make it in the CM as is? So. Um, uh, I was grateful to hear the comments because it gave me an opportunity to sort of fight fire with fire. But UK Power Reserve, uh, when I started the business, co-founded the business in 2009, it, it was really, uh, certainly there was a market opportunity. There was an underserved need and you could see that the flexibility in the system was going to be an absolute requirement. And then secondly, uh, you could see that the environment was welcoming to independence and to innovators and to flexible generation. And uh, with that, we set out on our first 8.8 .8 megawatt pi pilot project. And we have since um, exceeded uh, over half a gigawatt in operation today, and will be a gigawatt in operation within two years. So we consider ourselves um, to be the leading flexible generator in the UK and one of the leading flexible generators in the world. And I will say that in terms of regulatory uh, change and discussion, um, when I landed here in 2009, I thought it was amazing how independent and how easy it was to connect to the system. You know, you obviously need to follow, um, follow the guidelines and follow the applications and the other principles. But I was wondering where, where the hell are the utilities not allowing us to connect, basically? Because in the US, as I joked in the utility week about the CUSC <laughs> panel here in the UK, it's a mafia-like um, structure in the US where the utilities control generation, transmission, et cetera. Here it's a little different. They control the panels, et cetera. And um, you know, I sympathize with the job that Dermot and his team have to do because in, in many ways it's um, you know, the, the budget, the mandate, the scope, the team is, uh, is under-resourced significantly. And they rely, on, um, they rely on the large incumbents of the national grid to lead their thought processes and conduct the analysis because they don't have the budget and the resources and the people to do that. And then, you know, I'm critical, obviously, of decisions that Offgen makes, um, and, um, but it's, it is the, it's what is handed to Offgen. All the bodies, all the, all the code panels are controlled by the large incumbents, and they don't give Dermot and his team a lot of options. And so certainly we see a future where, um, where Off-Gym has handed more tools and can do more to encourage, um, not discourage, a flexible system. Great. Alex, maybe if we could uh, bring you here and, and perhaps uh, broaden the debate out a little bit. Um, wh when we think about known unknowns like battery capex reduction, uh, uh, you know, topics like that, 
What in your mind is, is the thing in the industry that we are getting most wrong at the moment? What's the consensus view that you most strongly disagree with? Um, <clears throat> well, first, thank you, but um, I think the question is not where um, everybody is wrong. I think the question is um, how many knows, known unknowns and how many unknown unknowns are there in the room? And um, I think the difference between the two is generating the business opportunities for the ones who get first the knowledge about the unknown unknowns. And um, I mean, it's, it's now 10 years ago when that uh, we built the first large-scale battery system in Berlin, and now, as we have seen, market share in Germany, Germany for frequency above 50 percent. I think the market in, in, in UK is, is really hot and nearly, and nearly full. Now it's the time for the next step, and I think this is what we call midterm storage systems. It's not about frequency, it's not about voltage stability, it's about the big production peaks that we get if a big wind system is passing by. So we have production peaks between six and eight hours, whether it's um, over noon for the solar or it's a, a big wind system passing by, and we are dealing about real high volume of energy. It's not only power, it's energy. So batteries are by far too expensive. And it's also not so, it makes, does also not make so much sense to store the energy as electricity because you have too much electricity at all in the system. So we focus a little bit on uh, the needs to decarbonize also the um, heat markets um, that we have in all industrial countries. And um, this is where our technology is based on. We are using steel as a storage medium, high temperature, 650 degrees, super high energy density, super long duration, super low cost. So we end with um, costs to store the kilowatt hour. Um, in, for the first prototype systems, we are below five cents, and, and in a two to three year period, we will be around two cents per kilowatt hour. So that's not a big amount. And um, as what we feel now as trends, and this is maybe to, to help you to get this from the area of the unknown unknowns to the known unknowns, um, what, what, what we came across are, are two big trends in, 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 in Germany right now. One trend has to do with uh, is taking place on the communal level. As, as maybe a few of you know, the, what we call solar revolution in, in Germany in the 90s started with um, roughly 200 communes deciding that they are paying a super high feed and tariff for people who decide to go solar. And this, is, this was the basis for the first IPO, solar, whatever the solar industry started. And the whole world laughed about the German approach with this feed and tariff, but um, in a way I think to kick the whole thing off it, it was pretty helpful. Now we have, again, a movement that's coming from the communal sector. I mean, the communes in Germany are pretty sick of our national government doing nothing in reducing CO2 footprints. You know, we have this um, clear-cut um, um, rooftop um, where um, more uh, um, additional power, um, solar and wind, is only with limited auctions and whatever. Uh, but the cities don't get rid of their carbon footprint um, we have the problem with um, air quality, whatever. And a lot of people on the communal level, um, especially with a, with a cost, with a fallen cost of renewables in their mind, um, they become active. And um, it's not 200, but we are close to that, that um, we are in contact with. And what we are doing with these guys, um, just um, to explain a little bit, is super interesting. We are building small industrial parks, in, 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 we are talking about small cities, not big cities, small industrial parks where we are aggregating um, energy consumers, for example, food processing industry needing high temperature steam, data centers with a need for clean and cheap electricity. Mm. And we are combining these with um, local wind and solar parks, supplying without any connection to the grid, electricity to the, to the industrial side. We are using the heat that is um, in, in, on, in, in, on average 60% um, of the overall produced um, energy. So if, if, we, if we combine a solar, solar and wind system with our technology, we end up with 60% of the whole energy production as heat and 40% as electricity. So the electricity is, is being used in industrial purposes. The waste heat of the industry is used to heat um, the district heating system of the small city. The waste heat of that 
is used to heat greenhouses, bringing also labor and work for, uh, with regional produced um, biocrate food. Mm. So we are talking about something like more hol holistic um, ap approaches. I mean, this is this is not the, the um, this must no this doesn't sound like like a big trend, but my feeling is it will become a big trend because um, I think that the, the big the, the big change um, um, to ten years ago is that a lot of people and they are not specialists in energy and not specialists in ecology, but a lot of people got that. It's much more than simply having an energy transition. Mm. We, have, we have to move towards a much more sustainable way, and this is concerning circular economy, it's concerning the way we produce and, and, and deal with food and stuff like that. And this is, this is going on, at least, at least in Germany. This is one trend. Um, the, the other trend is the big energy consuming industry that also was, um, at, let's say, far away from the, from the renewable energy business in, in the past. But now it's becoming close because with the technology options that, that we have, we are able to supply process heat, steam, CO2 free to the industry in areas with a large oversupply of wind. And, as a lot of you will know, we have in northern Germany, we have a high overproduction of wind. That means if um, the, the wind systems are, are passing by, um, we are causing in the moment above 1 billion um, euros as cost in simply regulating um, the, the, the turbines down. So if you have a technology to take away these peaks out of the grid, to store them and to give them as, as process steam, you can replace gas as the fuel with CO2-free surplus electricity. Mm. And um, this market, only the, the, the market for process heat in, 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 in Germany, it's um, also in the range of 100 plus terawatt hours. So it's significant. I mean, it's, it's not so much in the discussion because up to now, only gas was suitable to, to, to give that, but now there are alternatives. And this has a big implication also on your calculations, for example, on um, the growth of subsidy-free um, renewables. Mm. Because we are, we are involved in projects where in cities where normally the people hate wind turbines, they voted for the wind turbine because it will bring CO2-free heating at fixed price for the next 20 years to their home. Mm. And all of a sudden, the aesthetics of this wind turbine are completely different, believe me. Mm -hmm. and, and this, the same, um, n n n the, 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 if, if you look now on the possibilities that are rising in, in, in using very cheap renewable energy in the, in the heat sectors, I think we can discuss about how to recalculate the, the, the growth potential for renewables in, in, in Europe. Um, yes, so in a, in a way, I think that um, the renewable game um, has already started, mm -hmm. but there is a lot of potential especially if you combine the possibilities of decentralized value creation, because from my point, this is what it's all about. If you, if you look on, on the mega trend digitalization, we will have a lot of workforce set free in the next 10 years in Germany. The people need to do something. So we will have to rethink about the regional value creation. And my point of view, this could, a part of that could come from the um, local generation of energy. I mean, the moment the money is going to Russia for gas and to Arabia for the oil, why shouldn't it stay in, 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 in the region? And the next thing is that with the, with the surplus um, heat that we have, with the waste heat, we can um, completely um, reinvent the way we produce um, biological food. And if you think about 100 years ago, we had, I think, 60% of the people working on the fields, getting the crops out. Mm. In the moment in Germany, it's less than 2%. Mm. But why, in a, in a future, maybe 10 years ago, why shouldn't it be again 6 or 7 or 8% people um, working locally on, 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 on the production of, of, of food? So I think the combination, the, the next game will be um, using renewable energy as part of more holistic projects, combining <coughs> the energy industry together with um, the circular economy and, and the agriculture. So, this is what um, I want to bring on the table today. Thank you. Great. Um, Jojo, we, we briefly touched on their kind of de decentralized systems. Um, you, your company, uh, Electron, is, is the kind of leader, or one of the leaders in this space. Can you describe 
for us what the impact do you think blockchain will have on the system, but also um, is my taxonomy here fair? Is it an unknown unknown, or are we just not thinking hard enough about the potential future system architecture? So I hate to pick uh, issues in Rumsfeld straight away. I think it's an unknown known, okay. which is the fourth category. Um, <laughs> I think that a lot of people don't really know what it is, but they know it's transformative and they're not totally sure why yet. Um, the, the reason, um, well, so, so firstly, what Electron does. So essentially, we build shared digital architecture uh, for players in the energy space um, to solve immediate problems they have and, 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 and help create markets they want to play in. Um, so two of our kind of key projects within that um, uh, always look at areas in which coordination is really desperately needed to kind of uh, enable kind of more participation. Um, the first one is in the flexibility market. Uh, at the moment, you've got a situation where you've got so many different types of essentially embedded optionality in a single asset, like take a battery. Uh, a battery can provide capacity, it can provide energy, it can, it can sell a locational service, it can sell to a local energy consumer, it can, it, it, it can help balance a system or a trading position for different parties. So what, what our flexibility platform is trying to do there is essentially vertically stack those revenues instead of demanding that the battery owner or optimizer horizontally stacks and provides different services in different time periods. And that's all about really breaking down the uh, fundamental ability of the battery into different attributes and, 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 and the uh, attributes of the bids as well. So, for example, a DNO and an SO could share a single action of a single asset in a single time period. So that's the first piece. The second piece that, that we're sort of building in this, in this coordination space is an asset register. Because you know, essentially, as soon as you've got all those different parties bidding on the same asset, they need to know they're referring to it in the same way. And, and, and at the moment, we've essentially centralized control of keeping assets, so data sets up to date across lots and lots of different parties and silos. And we're trying to bring that together into kind of one version of truth that lots of different parties can have a hand in in updating. So, so the central theme there is coordination uh, and, 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 and this kind of shared, shared digital data structure. Um, and and, and I, think, I think that's why blockchain is going to be so transformative as a technology in that space. It enables that coordination across a very, very simple set of rules. And it enables that coordination in a way in which the, the, the certain parties can set rules around uh, limits as to what can happen um, and, and, and essentially set the outcomes and let the market work out lots of different ways of delivering that. So, so essentially, hopefully, if, if we can, we collapse that long-held trade-off in, 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 in that the global energy markets have made between like coordinated and, and kind of vertically integrated monopolies and then, and then kind of um, you know, truncated across function and lots of competition all the way up you can essentially set a, a shared data infrastructure, a shared set of rules, and allow lots of different models, business models to attach to that and try and create value within that. And peer-to-peer is one. We hear peer-to-peer -peer all the time. But, but you know, I, I think probably peer-to-peer -peer has too much mind share and attention share, because that's only one way of engaging uh, distributed assets. I, th I think what's clear is we need lots of different ways of engaging distributed assets. Some of those are going to be household batteries, solar. Some will be batteries. Some will be aggregated white goods, and some of them we haven't even thought about yet. We just need to get the data infrastructure right. Great. So, so when, when you talk about blockchain and electronic conferences like this, what's the kind of resistance that you most commonly come across? In what way uh, are we, as an industry, most anchoring to the past and, and potentially not seeing the, the, the decentralized future? Um, the resistance. I mean, the, 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 the there's a lot of resistance about peer-to-peer -peer models mm. uh, in, in blockchain, and, and they're normally seen as synonymous. Um, and there's a lot of resistance around the energy usage of public blockchains. But there's a balloons I can pin quite quickly, because I think you know, peer, the peer-to-peer -peer models today that use blockchain are decentralized layers on top of completely centralized settlement systems, and they all have to go through, through a supplier eventually. Um, we're sort of talking about decentralizing a bit higher up. Um, and then, and, and, and then the, the kind of high energy usage piece is only applicable to public blockchains. I, uh, certainly the ones we're concerned with are enterprise blockchains that, that, that run on proof of authority um, that actually end up looking quite like 
centralized uh, platforms, except that lots of people can read, lots of people can write, uh, and then you, you, you can attach, um, you, you can essentially attach value to, mm. to preferred outcomes. I think, I, 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 I think one of the reasons people are quite excited about it is, is when they understand uh, how, how differently you can run data infrastructure projects uh, with this technology. So if, if, if you think of, kind of you know, two of the biggest data infrastructure um, projects we've run recently, things like the DCC, the data communications company, and, 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 and Project Nexus, and just how difficult and expensive it was to sort of mandate one off. These will be the conditions around which we want to kind of grow this data set and build this data architecture. And blockchain lets you completely fragment it. It lets you build a little bit of it at a time in a, in, in a, in a, in a like, try and test different ways and essentially expand it from the edge as long as you're not contravening any of the kind of centrally established rules. Mm. And um, so when you listen to that, how, what obligation do you feel as a regulator to get ahead of this change? Or do you see yourself as letting it evolve and then, and then reacting to it? I suppose a philosophical question about the, the way you think about disruption and, and regulation. So I'd like to think we were the Goldilocks regulator just getting right, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I think in some fashion, as I said, we, we don't invent rules. Um, I'm conscious of the sense, without, you know, without stressing my very strong commitment to the, the whole idea of encourage innovation, mm. the number of entities who come to, say, my office, um, not necessarily a pleasant experience, and say, I'm an innovator, um, is, is legion. Um, mm. That's, that's good. I'm not criticizing anyone for coming. One of the, the vision just expanded, I found hugely powerful, actually, personally. Mm. I found it hugely. Will it, will it necessarily be work out in that sense? Will blockchain be, in some sense, uh, the, the technology that, that permits <laughs> many of the benefits spoken about? I don't know. Um, I really don't. And I would, as I said earlier, I do not care to specify what a future will look like. As a regulator, I think our job is, as upholding the rule book, uh, is to try and ensure that the both, and this is with government too, the licensing system and the frameworks of codes, et cetera, are as future-proof as possible. Mm. They're clearly not perfect, as I said at the start. The, the challenge as a regulator is, I don't think it's necessarily to lead the way, but it is to respond relatively quickly to some of the technologies that are coming on and ensuring that, the, if you like, the rule book is malleable to those. Against a framework where, um, I suppose I want to make this point clearly and maybe respond to one point Tim said, against a framework where many innovators and many people who see themselves as innovators, and they are innovators, I'm not questioning that, will fail. Mm. Um, their business models will wither. Mm. Um, I'm not welcoming that, but I'm saying that is the nature of these things. Some will flourish, some will wither. Um, and that's, that's a reasonable kind of framework to have. Um, we should expect that. We should expect to see that, and I don't think it's necessarily a problem. The point is, do you have a rule book that is set in a sufficiently flexible way to allow those who, who, are, who, who are going to flourish to, in fact, flourish? Hmm. My last point, maybe I'm being overly sensitive in reacting to Tim, but was the point about, I, just, I don't feel, I really don't feel Ofgem is not resourced on, on issues of charging uh, at all. I, I also, um, perhaps understandably, would be, just dismayed at the prospect that uh, sort of larger companies were doing our thinking for us. I really would push back very strongly on that, in so much as we are bringing thought leadership to the specific issue, I would say, of charging arrangements for the grid. We are doing it ourselves. I don't want to sound triumphalist, and yet perhaps I will, in the sense that uh, you know, recently two very large companies with a host of others appealed a code mod decision, which we had thrown back, to appeal to the CMA, and the CMA held for us. Now, who knows what will happen with that going forward? But the notion that we sort of are bound to the larger companies, I would, I would frankly utterly reject. And as I said, the point of a rule book, of a, of a, a de facto referee, which is not entirely what we are, mm. is that you will hear things from different interests. There are a myriad of different interests, all people with justifiably putting forward their own views as to why things would work for them. Mm. The key to a, to, a, to a regulator is trying to do so fairly and reasonably. Um, I think, I think I've monopolized, I was attacking monopolies earlier, but I will continue my temporary monopoly of the conversation <laughs> to say, to go back to the access charging issue, um, which is actually slight, which in one sense is moving away from blockchain, but perhaps not, um, is the sense of looking forward, access to the grid, I think, is going to be a hugely interesting issue over the next year, two years even. And some of the, I mean, two projects that are on the way that off Jimmy will you will see more about in the next few months I want to mention. One is access charging. Hmm. Uh, how we, you, people, how people, when they connect to the grid, how we use, make sure that that 
that, that connection charge is, is flexible. Mm. The traditional first come, first served, I own this connection charge, it is mine forever and ever. That is probably not the best way going forward. Mm. So we have a project that, we'll, that we've already seen something on, we'll come out with more proposals on that. A second point is something we've called our targeted charging review, which I think is quite a fundamental issue mm. because it will talk about those, including those who see themselves as innovative, who, who are innovative, people who are doing on-site generation, a variety of other things, who are bringing decarbonized technologies, innovative technologies, but how we, they, how we all pay for the grid. So the targeted charging review is taking on the, frankly, extremely difficult task of thinking how, going forward, will people pay for access to the grid. Mm. I think by its very nature, that is going to be, quite frankly, contentious. Mm. Difficult, contentious questions, as the minister sp spoke earlier, questions of fairness will come up with it. They are unavoidable for regulators to think about. We'll have to balance efficiency of fairness, mm. other things, in what will almost, by definition, be a contentious process where every different person says, no, me, I'm the guy, I'm the innovator. Mm. And we will have to make judgments, and that will be extremely difficult. But I can promise you we are, I think, well-resourced for it and actually looking forward to what will be a hugely interesting exercise. Hmm. I could just add something there, of course. probably in defence of, uh, of our regulator. I mean, this is not a UK-only problem. I think almost all developed grids across the world and their regulators are having conversations about moving to, you know, fixed versus, you know, the kind of capacity charge for fixing. And I, I've, I spent probably two months of the last three in the US talking about this recently, and, 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 and there is huge respect for the outreach and the accessibility and the work Ofgem's doing in this. We've been asked by FERC a lot, well, what would Ofgem do? How, you know, like, how, are, how are they bringing innovators to the table? I, I, I think Ofgem is very forward thinking mm. in that, in okay. that space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tim, maybe, maybe parking that uh, issue of, of regulation, what do you see as the next wave of disruption in, in the flex space? I mean, what keeps you up at night? in terms of technology shifts in the flex space. Mateusz showed there's a kind of 26 gigawatt size of the prize by the 2030s. UK, obviously, UK PR obviously wants to win a part of that. What do you see as the threats and challenges to, to you as, uh, over the next 15 years? So I really can't talk about regulatory change, huh? Okay, so I'll go to something else. I mean, I'll lay, lay awake at night thinking, what is Dermot gonna do tomorrow? Um, uh, I say that in jest, obviously. For us... Um, <laughs> Well, I think that um, uh, certainly it, it, we lay awake at night wondering, you know, you know when, when might the large incumbents catch on and start mm. innovating and acting more flexibly. And I think the reality is that'll be some way in the distance, so I don't, I don't really lose sleep over that. And um, I think it's probably technology, harnessing unused megawatts that are out there in a real way. Mm. I think DSR, for the most part, is... is um, is kind of one of the great fallacies perpetrated on, on the UK consumer. I think it's been a lot of backup diesel to date. And I think those who can be more efficient probably are more efficient day to day, hour by hour. And so it's really about uh, diving even deeper and finding you know, where, where are those hidden megawatts that can, uh, that can help balance the system. And then electric vehicles, uh, electrification of heat, you know, how will that, how will, how will that uh, interact with the system? But, you know, we've built a business at UK Power Reserve that hopefully will be able to uh, be as resilient and flexible as the system we're, we're working to, uh, to help create and support and to plug that flexibility gap. Great. So we've got a couple of polls uh, coming up. And what I'd like to do is kind of poll our audience on, on a kind of high-level statement and then have you guys... Uh, kind of agree or disagree with our audience, maybe push back if you think they're being uh, a, a, a little bit under-ambitious. So <laughs> we've got well, the first one. Sorry, it's a little bit difficult to see. We're kind of basically asking here about the likelihood of a genuinely decentralized GB electricity system. H how likely do we think this is as a concept? It looks like the voting's actually pretty even at the moment. Um, well, I think we'll leave that for you to, to determine. You, you, can, you can define the terms of the question as you see fit. But, Jojo, perhaps we'll start with you. We've got 60% saying unlikely, 55%. Do you think that's fair? I'm, I'm missing two definitions. Uh, what is dececentralized and by when? Um, so let's say by the is, 2030s. Is there, 2030s, 2040. By 2030. Is there anyone in this room who doesn't think at least 30% of generation will be distributed by 2030? I mean, that's pretty decentralized. <laughs> yep. So, yes, I mean, 
Yes, that, 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 that's where so much of the value is going to move and has got to move. And the fact, I mean, I don't think DSR is a fallacy at all. I mean, there, there aren't the data structures that let small-scale DSR scale today, but we're building them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, defini it's, definitive how, yes. How, yeah, how, how on earth are you? I mean, I, well, I, actually, can I ask one more question? Of Who course. thinks Hinkley Point will be generating electricity by 2025? <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, that was no one. <laughs> Let the record state. You're, you're much braver with your poll questions yeah. than I am, uh, fortunately. And, and, and one more then. Can we get the next poll up, please, guys? Um, we'll just give it a second. Uh, a re uh, renewables plus flexibility GB system without additional nuclear or CCGT. So I suppose this comes into your question. Matthias, Matthias showed us only 1.4 gigawatts, I think, of CCGT by the 2030s. I suppose we're asking uh, how uh, our audience views on how uh, good Aurora's forecasts are to some degree, and it looks like the majority are saying pretty good. Um, Tim, could I bring you in here? Do you think the audience is, is correct in responding to this statement? about it. I think, um, yeah, I think flexible generation is the future. Baseload generation um, has, has a small role to play as a sort of a very limited foundation. The reality is we need to move towards a lower carbon, no carbon future and flexible, flexible baseload is that future. Great. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Could you join me in thanking our excellent panel? Uh, <laughs>